Hello, I'm L.D. Green, a Valley poet. I want to thank NCTV for allowing me to come in and read some of my poetry. I will read my, my theory of life and poetry in general. A little bullet statement. Go when you know. Stay when you don't. Read the first page first and the last page last. Never rush to the back, for you will miss people, places, adventures. Read the whole book, investigate the signs, live the storyline, and you will see if you read strong enough. First poem is entitled, Songbirds at night. I never said I am the one who could tear down darkness and let in the sun. Never ever did I say I could take the dark, turn it into the day. Days are dark and grainy with little hope here. The little hope we have is being strangled by a fear, a fear of never knowing, of a home, how dust becomes driven, that's the story I've been shown. You see, I'm kind of like a child, there's sparks in my eyes. You see, I'm kind of like a child, except I know someday I'm going to die. And what will dying take from me? Will it take this search for tranquility? Or will it raid and rape and knock me down and take this strangling fear that keeps me awake? I am always awake. The next poem I shall read is from the chapbook, Last Page First, which is one continuous poem. It's a little difficult to read. You're actually starting from the last page first. I am walking and waving. My thumbs, they are high. I am twisting in circles under this planet-filled sky. I am as unsure of the direction as to the answer of why is the sky so wide? Why is the sky so wide? And questions that are left unanswered, they leave plenty of room for lies. Lies such as the stars are born in triplicate, the moon, the sun, exact duplicates. And it is important to remember that all lies need to be this blatant, need to be this glamorous. Suddenly, up and pull, two people slowly passing past. A red-armed driver offers me a ride, but only so long as if I would drive. Out from the front seat to the back seat, Next to a curly-haired looking angel, he does slide. I put the car into forward, and we headed onward, toward words, somewhere. So I said, hey, let's go ahead and head west. And as soon as we went ahead and went west, his hurt upon her began to hurt her hard. So each mile traveled seemed more like just traveling a yard. And then I hear him say, hey driver, let's pull over and pass her around. Let's pass her around. Well, I turned and I looked and I saw this monstrous jerk. 
He had a hand on her breast, and the other was up her skirt. I said, fella, if you do not treat her better, I am going to show you what it's like to really hurt. To really hurt. Well, he gave her another squeeze. So with a brick, I then did. I showed him what it was like to really hurt. To really hurt. Then I had her kick him in the head five times so bright. I told her to get every bit of anger that she has ever felt, to scream it out, to take it out on his head this night. So from the top of her head and out the toe of her boot, she screams, Juan, you need to treat people better and her boot to his head and Two, shite on you, his head gets her boot. Three, don't you ever look at me. And four, five, was straight to his eyes. And she says, do you understand me better now? And six, seven, eight, nine, don't you ever again ever brutalize. And I had to grab her and hold her, and she was shaking, screaming, saying, I hope you really hurt. I hope you really hurt. And from a hospital bed, I heard he had penned the words that said, he really hurt, that he really hurt. So now he knows what it's like to really hurt to really hurt. And this woman, she loved me so, and any gift was mine. I chose none. She says, marry me now, and here is our castle, and I am your woman. You may be my master. We shall live days so gravy. I left one day later. I started feeling wavery. And I wish I had not have rushed to the back and read out our final paragraphs. It could have been such paradise had I paid closer attention to the front of our book. I could have left later. Years later, possibly. Yes, later when I was feeling more stably. But you know, you have to go when you are feeling wavery. But my leaving was easy on her because I made it so. She said all she wanted was my child, a piece of me that would be with her for more than just tomorrow. And girls like me, she said, I know there shall be so many others. And I understand you're leaving, but please believe me when I say I need a piece of you in order to keep a reason for breathing. Stretch out, I asked her so. I want to memorize you from your curly swirls to the pinkness of your naked toes. And now as I lie upon you, I shall whisper things I'd like you to know. Always leave your bedroom window cracked a bit, for I shall be the cold breeze that breaks in and gets your breasts erect. Yes, I shall be on you and under you Yes, press beside you. And now as I come inside you, I let you know I love you. And now by my leaving, I let you know that I will always love you. And once again, I leave loved and not shoved. And back pages, back pages are for living later 
not back a few pages ago. And so I go. Three simple words. So I go. They barely make up a verse. So I go. Yet why these words? Do I say them so? So I go. I'm going to take Situation Highway that seems to be my front yard. I am going to go around and see my mom. And so I go around mom's and I tell her I am hungry. She makes me a sandwich. It was a ham and cheese without the cheese. Not a ham sandwich. She said it was a ham without cheese. I said, Mother, I am angry. She gave me some shells for the revolver. And I told her I was unhappy. And she gave me some razor blades and band-aids. I said, Mother, my whole world, it really stinks. She was quick to mix me up a drink. It was some kind of gin and amphetamines. She said, son, this shall temporarily be your best of friend. It shall help you with situations. You know the kind that's out there blowing, blowing down the highway? Well, that's situation highway and son, you know, that's your front yard. Sometimes I like to drink. Sometimes I like to smoke. When I go around my mom's, I got to do both. Cause she likes to know where I've been, what I've done, whom I've loved, and why the hell I've been gone so long. Son, why you been gone so long? And with a little bit of truth potion, I can be 100% royal. I said, Mother, I met this girl, love, but I felt this thing in me and it made me, you know, leave. She was lovely and heaven sent and we made stars together. We made stars together. But I left. Was that right? I read our last page first. Why do they not put the first page last? She said, son, maybe you did the right thing. Perhaps it was the wrong thing. I am just so very pleased to see that you did something. You are just like your father. You're out blowing, blowing down the highway. Well, that situation highway and son, you know, that's your front yard. Let me pack you a lunch. It's an obvious journey that you're on. And it looks like you could use some shoes. You left a right one here last year. And there's a left one right over there next to the box labeled some things. Now I heard her say this all over the commotion out on the highway. No, it was not a car crash. No animal got hit. No, no, no. It was only voices off the meetings I've yet to meet and other addictions to be tempted by and teased by up the street. And I rarely hear them. Really? Really? How rarely? Mother asks. You are just like your father. You think out loud. You wear no mask. So I go, mother. But first, last page first. Can you tell me who she is? You know the woman when I was four, she swam the pond. She is in my dreams again. I can feel her. She is everywhere. Son, 
follow your shadow while you're still tall. You shall see her again, and though our yard is not small, if you should see your father, let him know I'd like to share this, my last autumn's fall. So I go, mother. So I go. Stop wandering the way, son. Your high shadow, no. So I go. So I go. Three simple words. So I go. They barely make up a verse. So I go. Yet why these words? Do I say them so? So I go. And as I go, a poem naturally occurs to me. Parallel lines are never meant to meet. And strychnine was never invented to be a drink. But if you look down a highway far enough, those parallel lines, they meet. And if your life is rough enough, you can make a bet that strychnine you will surely drink. As for me, I shall form the letter C and blow on down the highway as lost as the tumbleweed. And when the wind takes a rest, I shall look at the past behind me. And that shall be enough to remind me of just why I am tumbling blindly, looking for new places to age and women to save, to make a list of places where I can go and not be stepped on. And since the age of four, the woman who swam the pond. The next poem is called so I go. Just kidding. Um, again, that was just a uh, maybe a quarter of the poem. Um, last page first. Just a um, chapbook about. Um, life being a book and the situations we deal with family relations love lost on a good day uh, the next poem I will read is called watery grave because uh, the other half of life is death. And I remember Nick Cave saying the sooner people, children, adults learn the side of sorrow, the easier it is to deal with happiness and to embrace happiness and to hold on to happiness if you have a clear understanding of sorrow. All you need to know is when I go, stand me up in a flip-top box. Send me down the river with the rainbow trout. Give me a new hairstyle and two different socks. Some pictures of my mother's and some jars of fluff or nutter. See, I was born this way and I live this way. Life to me is a watery grave. A watery grave. Life to me is a watery grave. I'd like you to all stand at the edge of the muddy banks and yell out to me. Yell like you are being spanked. Wear your ugliest jackets and your holiest mitts. And then wave to me and we'll all get high I'll see us down the river on the other side. Be good to each other 
Don't ever fight. I love you all, and I will miss you all. But right now, I'm looking forward to going over the falls. I was born this way, and I live this way. Life to me is a watery grave. A watery grave. Life to me is a watery grave. A watery grave. Amen. Amen. I'm in deep water. Next poem is called Take Me to a Lake or a Reservoir, even to a backyard pond, so long as the water is warm. Place me in a place, fill it full of unrest. When you dig my grave, make it the shallowest. Then you may toil in the soil that's above my buried bones. Just do not rot the sod with quirky quotes you've learned from home. For I am a traveler and I've got certain needs. Dig me up every three or four weeks and take my bones to meet my soul it'll be down on some jetty and I'll be eating tons of Grandma Pat's spaghetti some love light some love light streams ray way colors the nay does opposite what dark may say, dark they stray into the gloom, dark who not walk they sway, filling doom rooms, carting distraught rooms, that blackened sun to dull in ways love light say. Dark peg legs to stay upright amongst the monks who live without sun, love, light. That's about some love, light. Some don't. Next poem is called Young Couple Dead, which is um, sad enough, the title. But um, like I said, in keeping with the Got to deal with sorrow to help with dealing with happiness and embracing happiness fuller than you normally would if you had no knowledge of sorrow. Young couple dead. She sits corkscrewed for the space she sits is small. And though she sits still, her head dances a mad wall. Grave look upon her face is because the wall she has faced, it is sad. Her thoughts, they ricochet. They are now all that she has. And she does not want anything else that would mean leaving things in her wake. She says, love me the way I am and my life I will not take. Sidestepping the question, he with a pillow in his hands. His expressionlessness mirrors a dead man's trance. The end of his nerve endings, well, they do so tend to bend, kind of like the cruelty that his cold shoulder sends. He would rather be anybody else, for he has nothing left to give. He says, I am out of everything, so why should I bother to live? She answers him by smashing her head on the wall with the feathered pillow down and down he falls. 
They are more than begging, begging for the end of their lives to come. And for whatever reasons, they easily do succumb. With the pillow pressed, he says, The weight of this world sure weighs a lot. Smashing her head again, she says, Soon it shall not. Her head bled, she is fully dead. For her sake, no more heartache. Pillow face, face pressed, in a sad way he suffocates. And written in her blood on his pillowcase, it does say, We are just going to rest, finally rest on this our final day. This is the life of a young couple that wed, a bonded vow that led to no rest, a relationship lacking the proper medicines. They only had each other, the young couple dead. And now they are dead they are dead. They are the young couple dead. And they are dead. 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 At the emergency morning mass, the reverend one, he stands and says, Neighbors, there's been tragedy. A young couple has been sadly found dead, yes a young couple dead, a young couple dead. Their deaths came by way of their own means. Unfortunately what this does mean is there can be no proper burying for the young couple dead. Not for the young couple dead but there is space for them, but it is not up in the heavens. Heaven is for those who have been severed from breath, not for those who do themselves in, as did the young couple dead, as did the young couple dead. So come, we shall dig two simple holes outside the church's fence. Grab shovels, but not the ones from the church's shed. And place to waste shall be the young couple dead. Will be the young couple dead. They are off to a place that's not kind with face. To where only the wind will wail with them. And never, ever will they ever rest. Enough said, bury the young couple dead. Bury the young couple dead. Well, I think it's fair to say that we have dealt with sorrow in some of these poems for certain. Um, This next poem is a little bit brighter and we can grasp and enjoy this poem better because we understand that we've been dealing with sorrow. So let's hold on to this happy poem. It's called Irish Medallion. Earlier today I was at the unemployment facility and the hiring man he says he wanted to see me wanted to know why I was not working. I told him to pick a reason and I asked him for his job. He said, sorry son, it's obvious. You couldn't dress a slob. But he gave me $60 straight out of his trousers. He said to go to the racetrack and put it on a horse called Irish Medallion. He said that horse would make me a winner. 
So I got to the racetrack nice and early. Irish Medallion was the fifth race at precisely 5.30. So race one, I took $30 and I got 30 to one. And I put it on a horse called Easy Wider. He won by his nose, I collected my dough. Then I went out back and I met a nurse and she took some additional green from her purse. She sparked it up and I made a joke. She passed it to me in a cloud of smoke. Then she kissed the page that said race three and her red lipstick stuck to a horse called Drink Heavily. I asked her if she really thought so, and she only smiled as she finished the smoke. So I took the ninety dollars to the window girl, the one who smiles the most heavenly. I said I'd like this all down on a horse called Drink Heavily. She gave me my stub and her phone number. She mentioned she had ten minutes between the ninth and the tenth runners. And then if I would get deep down with her, and get deep down with her fast, that even if I lost, I'd get my money back. Hell yes, I said. Hell yes, I said. The race? That was won by the first post. Drink heavily, obviously, drinks the most. Yes, of vitamins and minerals. Yes, mother's milk. He runs like a criminal. He runs real quick. He came down the quarter mile stretch and he looked at me and he winked at me. Yes, he winked at me like you would to a friend. I gave him the peace sign and he gave me the grease sign and he took off like a bolt of lightning and crossed the finish line first. It was real exciting. So I walked like the boss back to the window to collect my dosh. Now off to the bar. Finally, now I'm not the kind of man who normally wonders where a horse gets his name, but down at the end of the bar, wearing number eight with a black and gold mane, was Drink Heavily. And yes, he was. I bought him a couple of drinks. It gave me some time to smile and not think. I drank through the fourth race. And sideways I went without a care about the money I just spent. I said I want it all down on Irish medallion. I got a tip that he's a Guinness swallowing stallion. She asked me if my luck was freaky. I said, what was that? She asked me if I was dreaming. I was standing there just smiling. Finally, I I told her it was between the ninth and the tenth races that I was thinking. She shook her head and said she understood and she pointed to some bushes that bordered the woods. Just think, she says, after a few more races, nakedly we'll be rolling in them edges. This is when I bent my ear in time to hear the track announcer in a most excited voice announcing. Irish medallion from last to first. I slid my hand through the window and collected my winner's purse. Then I turned to the bar behind me because I heard a loud rumbling. It was drink heavily and he was stumbling. Yes, out of the bar and into his cart. He's got a problem, I heard his jockey mumbling. I told her, me and that horse, we have a lot in common. Once we start drinking, we really hate stopping. This poem is called Young Lady Lattisu. It is a Victorian era love triangle of poetic importance. Young Lady Lattisu, it is I who knock, your neighbor, Sir Constant Moon. Two full weeks have slowly passed, neither sight nor shadow of you has been cast. Are you wantonly engaged in adventure, with he, James, that directionless tramp, traveler? 
Has he stopped by for his yearly two-week scourge, which leaves him healthy whilst your vision does blur? The door on which I repeatedly knock, the knob turns. The face I so care to see stares back with tearful concern. Oh, Sir Constant Moon, James was due a fortnight ago. It has been since then that these tears have steadily flowed. Yes, down and down an absolute fortnight's worth. Enough tears to soak a desert's dirt. For I just wish to see, for I have a want to know, if James is amongst the living, and if so, where he now goes. Lattisu, let me enter and adjust your view. Toweling these tears is as hopeless as drying this morning's dew. Come now. Off with your dress shoes, do now rest assured, James to not show is perhaps a vision conjured. For no notice given of when he, James, would become present, yet off to some wicked wild race your mindset went. I mean to say the crown roast you have mealed without mess. Your clean pressed clothes so ever ready to become undressed. Even this chair in which you have stitched lovely new buttons. So he, James, can relax and remove the bother from his buttocks. Yes, you are where your ears seem eager to hear. Details of distant soup kitchens and of beds he's feared. His fairy tales will be guided by stomach mirages of finding lost tarts and of fresh edible garbage bin surprises. So Lady Lattisu, why want tales of such woe? Only you, your spoiled soul, does secretly know. For this picture perfect window in which you stare afar See that the wind is filled with ghosts, lost souls, and they are as mad as Mars. For why else would the wind be see-through? Why whipped with a wonder that spooks and never does amuse? The answer I wish was up to me to do choose. For your faith in above you would lovingly lose. Yes, you would trade years of proper church learning for just a go at being lost in a blow yearning to accompany your downtrodden mate sailing off in what is sure to become a long-gone cloudy state. Sure, ye will yell you, becoming too scared to tremble, holding on to dear James not by hand but by all that crumbles. For true lost souls cannot share in each other's fate. This whelming wind will do more than just separate. So for you to leave now, to find a follow to his tracks, is ghost chasing, which fades one's paint as palette does crack. For if in this, James, you somehow, some way, do find, he will only beg to differ each and every time. Because he will, with a twist of tongue and a teaseful mouth, teach you east is west and north to be south. Sadly, your coming to light will be nothing more than a vacant lot sought. And tall outside halls house only remorse and tainted thought. Oh, Sir Constant Moon, surely you must stop. You spin speech as dizzying as a toddler's top. For you to be so suggestful, how often have you peeped? 
James's stories are treasure, James being the key. So for me to find James, I must search his time waste. James has admiration of where the toothless pray. So I will search places where James endured downtime. I will question answers given by streets smart kind. Cities of alleys I shall hike like an expert. But a certain field of flowers I must wade through first. Flowers of James's sort. The spray painted daisies. The heavy scented slippers of blooming little ladies. The many piles of brittle pine from Christmas's past. The sentimental cemented ornaments that fast. Pigeon pods of lovely large different colored flocks. This view which does include a huge arc of rock. Field so alive with ivy and moss grown askew. James claims to intoxicate while breathing the fair air fumes. Soon I shall be missing more than your neighboring. Yes, from our genuine youth, the years we shared growing. To this day, now, how you bachelor tall, you're waiting so patiently for my hand to call. Yet my hand, my will, long to see other lands, lands that lie not here, lands of stories I can fan, to imprison in my way than for you to be shown, for you have been my constant suitor, and I your throne. Please spoil me not, a weak woman's way. Here now are the keys to my farming stone estate. A year to this day, my young lady, she traveled away. I stand so sharply, feelings for her have never waned. And I wonder if where she is, if she is pleased. Weeks pass lonely when each day I seem to live three. And three times the worry when one must worry with weight. Worried she has been captured, her want of return restrained. Yet what I worry of the most is my young lady wrapped warm in an adventurous coat. A coat containing the entwinement of what is different whilst shedding layers of remembrance of what is constant. And what is only constant is I, Sir Constant Moon, and my constant is a weight upon young lady Lattisu. Thank you. That was Young Lady Lattisu. Thank you again to NCTV for allowing me to come in and read some poems. My poetry can be found at local booksellers, Brightside Books. Uh, Turning Up Records has a vinyl release of some musical poetry. I believe the Odyssey Bookstore still has a couple copies of different um, chapbooks. The Battle of What's Worse is in circulation at the Springfield Libraries, so you don't even have to buy it. You can um, sign it out for a couple of weeks and uh, get to know that. It's written in an iambic pentameter, and also the book is beautiful. It's um, handbound by um, John Nove out of uh, South Deerfield, a magnificent uh, bookmaker and binder. He's a uh, gray seal book, book bindery. Um, there's etches in the book, etchings, by um, uh, Zia May's printmakings. So the, the book is gorgeous. It's, um, 
The story's not too bad either. So if you're, you're looking for stuff by L.D. Green, it's out there. Um, I also have an artist co-op if you're interested in acting, um, getting books published, um, musical bands. Um, I like to put everybody together in an uh, awesome collective. The, the talent that there is is amazing and inspiring. Um, so, hope to see you down the road. Thank you again.